Drop it in the basket later during our service so that we can get in contact with you. Um, let you know a little bit about our church. And on the back of all those connect cards, as always, there is a place for a prayer request. Please go ahead and write a prayer down and let us know how we can be praying for you as a church. Uh, not a ton of announcements. Uh, the main one is uh, Metropolitan Ministries tent is coming soon. And so uh, we need people to sign up. And there, the sign up is normally in the back at the uh, Connect Center um, is moved out to the lobby for this week. So if uh, you have a chance, go ahead and look in the lobby for the uh, sign-ups for that Metropolitan Ministries tent. And then if you have any questions at all, please come see Kevin Kruger right here. He's got hands up and a sweet mustache. And so come see him. 
Uh, any questions you have about the test? All right, we're going to go ahead and pray. So if you will join me in prayer, Father, uh, today is your day. And so, Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit uh, to, to come and fill us up this morning, Lord. Uh, that we are able to worship you in a new and powerful way, uh, that we connect with you this morning, Lord, in a new way. And so, Father, uh, this is all for you and your glory, uh, for from you and through you and to you are all things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. We have somewhat of a sad day today. Ricardo, this is his last Sunday with us. So, Ricardo, can you come up here? That's all right. Come on. Up. So, you know, we had a, a very tough situation when Mary Jo passed away back in December. And um, Ricardo was there for the funeral. And um, he came to me afterwards and he said, Hey, Rusty, uh, I'd like to help any way I can. I'm not sure he realized what he was asking when he, he did that. Um, More than he thought. Yes. Uh, but Ricardo has, uh, well, if you don't know, Ricardo, uh, probably about 12 years ago, you were, when you guys started coming to this church, nine years ago, and uh, Mary Jo, I'm not sure how she figures these things out, but uh, she perceived that uh, he might be good at, at playing the piano. I mean, he only started playing the piano like nine years ago. And, and under Mary Jo's tutelage, um, and then he's kept going. And um, he's a data analyst by day, uh, but a pretty good piano player by night, and an accompanist. <laughs> um, an accompanist is different than a piano player. It's, it's world, worlds of difference, and he does a great job. Um, he's got a great help of, for me for communion Sundays, uh, so that he can play through the communion and I don't have to fuddle through the keys. But uh, he's come to a point, he's been with us for actually about 10 months now, almost, right? Um, uh, and just been very faithful. Um, the choir loves him, the band loves him, and I'm sure you guys love him too. So we sent out a note to, you know, if you have some cards or, or letters you want to give, it may not have been as uh, very uh, um, obvious that it was out in the, the narthex. So I'm going to put this basket on top of the piano, and if you'd like to add something after the service, if you've got something, that would be great. <laughs> but, Ricardo. That's a big thank you, thank you. Yes. yes. I'm, uh, I'm personally going to miss you. You've been a great help. Um, we had a pretty good team, I think. We did. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Round of applause, yeah. And I would like to say to um, thank you to this church. I mean, I am, you know, my, my family. You know, my mom and I, for you guys who, who know us, like we're living proof, I think, of the impact that a small little church can have on somebody. Um, you know, on the way this church loves people, it loves on people, and helps them, you know, develop a, a new talent or, or give them opportunity to serve. So, uh, thank you so much for everything this church has given me. I hope I was able to give a little bit back, uh, but I'll always keep this church and everyone here in my prayers, and I love you guys. So, thank you. So, if you guys wouldn't mind, just bow your head. Reach out your hands just to pray for Ricardo and, uh, and his future, Lord. Uh, God, we come before you. God, just thank you for Ricardo, his heart. God, his blessing that has been here, Lord, not only for us, but for you, God, to, to, to use him as a young man. Uh, Lord, that loves you. And so, God, we pray for his future as he uh, is moving here soon. And, God, just his guidance and direction for his job in Tampa. And, God, just uh, God, be with him that he would find a church closer to home. And, God, just uh, um, be able to continue to worship and glorify you using his gifts and talents, God. So, Lord, we just pray a hand of blessing over him. Lord, be with him, walk with him. God, guide him into this next stage of life. Lord, we love him. God, we love you. We thank you for this morning. In your name, amen. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs> and now the choir piece, Ricardo, don't mess up. <laughs> I never made any promises. <laughs> <coughs>
so stand up, find someone you're not saying morning, say good morning, and we will get going on our worship. Don't stand up. <laughs>
And we are reading today out of James 1, verses 2 through 4. And the Word of God says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Yes. Oh, what a foretaste 
Like, I need you, Lord of everything. And the church that we're looking at this morning had that perspective. They had the perspective that they were patiently waiting. They were enduring. They were faithful in their walk with the Lord because they needed to be. This church, just like every other church that we've been talking about in this series, was surrounded by people who hated them. Surrounded by people who were not only just worshiping false gods, but were cult, were satanic, were, were literally offering babies to the devil. Now that seems very dramatic, but it's actually true. Like I'm reminded when I read scripture, not just the Old Testament, New Testament too. I'm reminded, like sometimes we look at today and be like, we can look at a number of different topics today and we're like, man, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Just FYI, has been doing that since the first set. <laughs> Like, sometimes we are victims of living in our own time period in the sense of only what we see and focus on. The world's been going to hell in a handbasket since Adam and Eve disobeyed. Like, during the Old Testament, when the Jews entered the Promised Land, the reason why God told them, you need to clear everybody out, wipe everybody out, kill everybody out, is because they were literally worshiping Satan. That's not over the top speak. They literally were. They were literally offering their firstborn child on the altar of a sacrifice, killing their own kids before Satan. And sometimes we look at, it, at today and we're like, oh, it's so much worse. And it's been bad for a long time. And this church that we're talking about today has to patiently wait. Now, what's interesting about it is we are to the Church of Philadelphia. Ever wondered where we got the, the name of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania? Where this, the uh, brotherly love. We're talking about where that came from too. And uh, this church has been patiently waiting for the Lord. That God even commends them on their patience. That they are waiting for Him and not waiting for what the world can offer. So as we get started this morning, let's pray and ask that God, that God would uh, guide us in the same way that we would patiently wait on God's timing in all things. Lord, we love you, Father. We thank you. And God, as we start this morning, God, we pray right now, Lord, not just a, a blessing over the service, but God, it would be a blessing to you. Sometimes, uh, you know, in the, the church, Lord, especially in the American church, we can walk out of a service and say things like, I don't know if I got a lot out of that. And we act like it's for us, but we need to be reminded it is for you. It's not how much I get out of it. It's, Lord, have I come to worship you? Have I laid my cares and my burdens? Have I repented from my sins? Lord, have you been blessed from my offering and my worship to you? God, I pray that our perspective on the church and when it comes to worship would not be self-centered, but God, it would be about you and you only. So when we walk out of these doors of this building, because we are the church wherever we go, God, we know that we have come to worship you, not ourselves. So Lord, I pray that we would be patient in our waiting for so many different things that you have us going through right now. As a church, individually, in our own homes, wherever it might be. That, God, we would wait on your time. Lord, we love you in your name. Amen. Now, when we started uh, our worship pastor search, uh, Mary Jo, when she passed away 10 months ago, when we started, uh, one of the first things I told uh, the church, you and the worship team, the choir, was this was going to be a process to find the right person. And we've gone through, if you ask the search team, we've gone through some highs and some lows. We've gone through some people that we have interviewed. We're like, oh, that's fantastic. Then we've gone through, through some resumes. It's like, were they blind when they put it together? I'm bringing, like, if you've ever done, like, a resume search for any type of job, like, when resumes come in, like, I'll be the first one to tell you. Like, I've done it at past churches and stuff like that. You get some resumes that come in, and it's just like, that's a nice resume. Like, it's at least put together well. Uh, now, whether the person's a good fit or anything else on top of that, it's still yet to be seen. Then you get some resumes that come in, and I'm not joking when I say it, it looks like my 12-year-old put it together. 
And it's like looking at like, do you really want this job? Like, if this is how you put it together, is this who we really want for this position? Not gonna lie, like, so you look at stuff like that and how it comes in. And so we've been prayerfully looking at it and praying about it, and we don't have the person yet, but we've been trying to patiently wait and waiting through the resumes and praying over and saying, Lord, guide us to the right person. And it's taken a bit. It's taken the time. And it's constant asking for prayer and reflection on every person that come, that sends a resume in and saying, God, is this, is this the right person? Now, and when you are in a place like that, maybe you have for your own job, maybe you have on the flip side, if you're the person sending in the resume or receiving the resume, or whatever it might be, it's a constant back and forth of prayer and reflection, of reading through it, of, of asking and talking together as a search team and saying, God, we just want your guidance in this. We want you to instruct us where to go, next steps, everything, and so forth. But when you're in the midst of it, sometimes it can feel hard. And sometimes it can feel long. You ever raise a baby? <laughs> like the baby, like the first six months, you say to yourself, this is just for a short time. But when you're in the midst of 2 o'clock in the morning, and that baby is three months old, and is screaming their head off, that short time of six months doesn't matter. Because it feels like forever. It feels like it's never going to end. It's like when you're growing up, it's like saying, one day I'm going to be in my 20s or my 30s, or I'm going to be married, I'm going to have all that I ever wanted. But in the midst of that day, you're like, yes, but I still have to deal with right here, right now. I think that's why the Bible tells us, you're not promised tomorrow. Give God the glory. Live for this day that God has blessed you with right here, right now. To live patiently on the Lord in our life. Because sometimes we, we so want to step into tomorrow. God, what's tomorrow going to bring? Instead of making the most of today. As Christians, that is our faith. Enduring through the heartache. Enduring through the suffering. Enduring through the curses. Enduring through all the things the world has to say about you. And saying, Lord, I'm still going to wait on you. Just as we wait patiently for a worship pastor. Just as we wait patiently, patiently sometimes as having a little baby. Sometimes we wait patiently in a job whether we're supposed to do something or not, we wait patiently because as Christians, we believe, God, you have the answer. I don't. The world doesn't. I wait patiently in you. And this is the perspective that this church has. They're waiting patiently on the Lord. Now, the church of Philadelphia, to give you kind of an idea, you can throw up a picture, is 25 miles southeast of Sardis. We talked about Sardis. You can look it up there. It's about 100 miles away from Smyrna, and it was built roughly in the second century. So if you look at number six on the right, kind of lower right uh, of where the seven churches are. Remember, this is Asia Minor, where Turkey is today. And these churches, one of the thoughts of, of understanding why do uh, John and, and Jesus has John write these letters, why does he write these letters to these churches? Well, they're in such a, a primary place of the Roman kingdom at that time. And they're in such a primary place where they have to battle back and forth between what the world is doing and doing to them and what God is asking of them. And so they give a, a great highlighted look for the church to come for the next 2,000 years of what the world is doing around them and what God is doing through them because he is God and they are not. And so we see this uh, as the church of uh, brotherly love, Philadelphia, that came from King Adelus Philadelphus II and his brother. And so the city, like the rest, had many pagan cults and satanic worship and child sacrifice in the city. And so we begin to read, if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelations 3, verse 7. And it starts off, each letter starts off the same way. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David 
What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. And that brings us right to our first point. This is a big part of the message here this morning. Who holds the key matters. Now, I want you to notice a couple things here right off the bat, right off the beginning, that we need to understand as believers, as we share our faith, who holds the key matters. Why? I want you to see that it says key singular, not keys plural. There's one and only one key. There's one and only one that holds that key. And the only way, the only entrance, and the only one who can is Jesus. It doesn't say keys. There's not a lot of, there's not many doors that lead to heaven. There's one. There's not many ways that lead to heaven. There's one. Jesus said himself in John 14, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when this starts off right here, it is Jesus reminding, it is him and him only whose words should be listened to, who's holy and true and holds the key to life everlasting. It's not pluralistic. This is God's way and God's way only. There's one key, one way, one person that opens and shuts the entrance, and that is Christ. But he gives us four identifications here. There's four identifications of why it's Jesus. The first one he says right at the beginning, these are my words. These aren't your words. These aren't past historian words. These aren't theologians' words. These aren't Satan's words. Whose words are they? They're the words of Christ. He makes that very clear right from the beginning. These are the words of Christ. He says, these are the words of him. He's talking about himself, Jesus. These are the words of him. So it explains to us very clearly that the identification is Jesus and Jesus only. These words came from anyone else. They would not be the key. <clears throat> but they are the key. I mean, that brings us to just our, our scripture, our word, our Bible that we have. Is we consider this the Word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. It is Jesus Christ. And so when we think about him saying, he brings us his Word, it is saying that we know, as a matter of fact, that we have the Word of God. It is his Word and his Word only. And so he's declaring that to the church. God is the only one who ultimately holds the key and gives the understanding to all things especially the right and wrong. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 actually says this, the back that up. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. When we look at scripture, scripture in and of itself says, all scripture is God-breathed. That means the authors, as they were writing, were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what they were writing because of what Jesus wanted to be put down on pen and paper or parchment at the time. It is from his lips to the authors putting it down so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So when Christ here tells the church that you have my word, what he is essentially telling us is you are thoroughly equipped for every good work. You cannot come to heaven someday and say, God, I didn't know. Yes, you did. And here's the thing about it too. This stands for all people, not just believers. Believers, someday, unbelievers, someday, when they die, they cannot stand before God and say, God, I did not know. That is not an excuse because you had the word of God given to us. You could have known, you could have read, you could have sought, you could have sought out who Christ was, and you chose not to. This goes for believers and unbelievers. Everybody has the chance and opportunity to say, I want God for it. To be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The second thing he tells us, right in the second part of that same sentence, it says he is holy. It's given us four keys right here in the first verse, and it's his words, and he is holy. The character of Christ is holy. Now, what does that mean? It means he is separate, he is unique, and he is distinct. There is no one like him. We cannot look up throughout history... They say at some point, every single person in the world has a doppelganger somewhere. Has someone that looks like them, acts like them. If you were to put them next to each other, you'd be like, that is that person. I see it right there. No one for Jesus. He is so distinct in every single way that he is holy. There is no flaw in Jesus. He is holy, and therefore he has the right to judge the church. 
And so it says it's his word. He is holy. Isaiah 6.3 even says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so scripture is telling the, the church, Jesus is telling the church, you have waited patiently because you have based your patience, your waiting, your longing on my words and because I am holy and that I am true and I am just. So you have every right to to base your waiting on me. And that leads us into the third part. He says, I am not only just holy, I am true. Truth flows from God. We talked about this before, but it's a great reminder. Maybe you've never heard this before. Maybe you're new. All truth is God's truth. Now that sounds like a grand statement. That sounds like a Christian <laughs> cliche. But if you truly think about it, it is truly true. There is no truth that has ever been, that is, or ever will exist where God says, you are so smart, I never thought of that. <laughs> He's God. And so if he is the creator of all things, gave us brains to think and knows even things that will happen before they happen, trust me, you didn't just figure something out that no one else has known. You figured something else out that you didn't know. Because God already knew it. There's a big difference there. Sometimes we live our life like, I am the smartest person in the world. No one could have done this. No, that's not even remotely true. doesn't matter what your IQ is. doesn't matter what you've invented. That's just not true. And so Jesus guards his church with the truth against false doctrine, against false prophets, and against false teachers. Psalm 33, 4 tells us, For the word of the Lord is right and true. Look at going back to what it's saying. The word of the Lord is right and true. Against false doctrine, against everything. He is faithful in all he does. And so he's telling the church here, you have patiently waited, and that patience is going to pay off because you've been patiently waiting because you have trusted my word, you've trusted that I'm holy, you've trusted that I'm true, and here's the final thing he says here. Just This is just the first verse. The final one here is because he holds the key. Think about the verse and what we just read. He says to the angel in the church of Philadelphia, right? These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. Now, what does that mean, he holds the key? The key of David was given to a man named Eliakim in the Old Testament. He was an overseer of the royal court. And what that key meant when he was given that key is the key gave him access to all of the kingdom. It's almost like when we think of today, when we, like, you see on TV, someone's given the key of the city. Well, back then, like, this was like the key to access to oh, everything that the kingdom had. He was given that key to say, you, there's nothing that is withheld from you at all. And so Jesus... Here is the ultimate heir of the key of David. This kingdom is Jesus' political and spiritual and godly right, and he will reign as he sees fit. And so when it says he has the key of David, it means he is the one that holds the key. He's the heir of the Messiah that was foretold to come through the line of David, that holds the key to everything that there is. So it's his word, he is holy, he is true, and he holds the key to everything that, it, that is. When they read this, they knew it was representation of the Old Testament. John here is repeating in Revelation what Isaiah had already written almost 850 years earlier. And that key, what it says at the tail end of verse 7, the very first verse that we're still on, says that only he can open and only he can shut. No one else. So when you think about walking in your faith, there is no one, including Satan, demons, fallen angels, and anybody else that can stand before God. See, sometimes we, we think of like our faith in like this raging war, that, but God has let that happen so more people can know him against what is going on with Satan and the demons. But the reality is, as soon as God decides, enough's enough, I'm coming back, he wins. 
Like, part of the book of Revelation is understanding. We already know the end. Like, let's, let's get a little glimpse into that. Scripture shows us clearly that God wins. Amen. Sometimes we think about a war, about what's happening in Russia and Ukraine or Israel and Hamas. We think about things of like, what's going to happen next? We don't have to think that or wonder that. We know what's going to happen in the end. God wins. And not only does he win, when God comes back, he will wipe out sin. He will wipe out the devil and the demons. He doesn't have to even really do anything. We think of like this great battle because it talks about a battle, but it's God. If God declares it, so let it be. I mean, that's literally what amen means. Let it be. And that's what's going to happen. And so this is what it says. It says, what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Jesus is sovereign over the church. No one can do anything without him, letting it be so. And so it shows us right off the bat that there are four keys to who holds the key and why it matters. And it's Jesus who holds the key to eternity in heaven and a life well lived here on earth matters. He holds the key. Verse 8. It says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, Philadelphia was home to a large Jewish population, a large synagogue community that was hostile towards Christians. It was a vastly Jewish population that lived in this city. And so Christ here praises the church for remaining faithful in the face of trials despite their limited strength, despite their small numbers. No, I can say this as a small church pastor. Being bigger is not always better. Where you walk in your faith, there are often times where you're going to have to walk alone and just without other people around. Sometimes we see the glamour of the big lights. Hollywood has taught us that through movies and through uh, TV shows and everything else. Being bigger is not always better. Reaching more people is always better. For Christ. But sometimes we're called to walk in faith. And in whatever situation that we're in, big or small, and it says here, where Christ has opened, no one can shut. Even with the, the hostile community around them, not one of them can shut the door for this church. See, I think what Christ is showing here, even with this church, and I think even for the church of today, is even in our weakness, we can stand strong in knowing what Jesus has done and is doing. It's not just what Jesus has done. It is what he continues to do. Okay, sometimes we read scripture... And we think to ourselves, man, these are great stories of yesteryear. These are great stories of the past. These are great stories of the Old Testament, New Testament. But what's God doing today? God's working every single day. He's working every single day in our lives, your lives, the people's lives around you, your family, this church. He's working in lives so that they, they may grow in maturity to know him better. And he's working that we may uh, communicate that faith to others so others would know him. Verse 9, it says, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, he refers to some harsh realities in these letters. He says, the synagogue of Satan who, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. These Jews have compromised their loyalty to Christ through the teachings of who? Who we have talked about in the last several weeks, the Nicolaitans. And had it fallen under whose spell? We talked about this woman two weeks ago, Jezebel's spell. Her name wasn't Jezebel, but it's the reflection of who Jezebel, Jezebel was in the Old Testament. They have fallen under the spell, the reality of so many people, even today in the church. There are many in the church today. Sometimes we just hear all the bad. I think this is really important as in Christians to be encouraged to. Sometimes we hear the bad because when bad things happen, people love to know it, especially within the church. There are many, when I say many, there are tens of thousands of faithful churches. There are millions, potentially even billions, of faithful Christians. Nine can do well, one can do bad, we're always going to hear about the bad. Well, 
Christ is saying here is, this church has done well. But there are still some that are seeking after the glory of the world. They're seeking after what the Nicolaitans taught, what Jezebel was doing. And so they're turning to the ways of the world instead of being faithful. So it's important as Christians to be encouraged. To be encouraged to walk in your faith daily. Be encouraged to never stop meeting together. To be encouraged, even when you're down and out, to say, Lord, I want to be faithful to you, even on the days I don't feel like it. Because those are the days we talked about last week that we grow the most. Verse 10 says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of and so Jesus does not condemn the church, but he does condemn its persecutors. They remain faithful to Christ. He will protect them from the hour of trial and make them pillars of God's heavenly temple. Now, it's important that we talk about this. And the second point this morning is to have the patience to be acknowledged by Jesus. This is a big, hard one for a lot of people to do. I have no doubt this church was getting persecuted on every side, but they waited on God. Notice what he says to them. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently. Jesus is acknowledging them for their faithfulness and their patience. We live in a world where we want things. Now he's saying you have been patient because you have waited on me. No other thing. And so scripture tells us the whole strong to God in his word. Hebrews 10.23 says it this way. It says let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. God is faithful in our lives. You see, people seek fame and fortune and fun and freedom from the world, but it is God who we want to be acknowledged by. We talked about this a few weeks ago, about this idea of patience in the Bible. We talked about even these people. Joseph waited 13 years. Abraham waited 25 years. Moses waited 40 years. Jesus waited 30 years. And sometimes we're like, Lord, I've waited three minutes. <laughs> When's my turn, God? <clears throat> sometimes we forget that waiting is on God's time, not ours. Sometimes we want God to say, God, I have a schedule to keep to. If you don't do what I'm asking, then I'm going to take the wheel and I'm going to take control. And that's not how God works. You see, if God is making you wait, can we just say you're in good company? Because he makes everybody wait. It's his time. The world offers things now, but God is a God of patience. Psalm 37, 7 through 9 puts it this way. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Sometimes we have asked this question. You see this question even in the news, in movies, in TV shows. Of like, Why does God seem to bless those who are wicked and I'm sitting here with nothing? This guy over here doesn't love Jesus, but he's got the yacht and I don't. There's so many issues with that kind of a story and that kind of question. I don't have time to begin with right now. <laughs> but we're called to be faithful in big things and in little things, with much and with little. Stop asking God, why can't I have more of this world? And start asking God, can I have more of you? It is such the better way to go about life. And so he says in verse 8, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. God is the judge in the end. He knows what everything leads to, and he knows what, your, he knows what your path leads to, too. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. He tells us what's, what's, which way the paths lead. That evil leads to destruction. But hope in the Lord, that path leads to inherit the land, leads to eternity with him. Some of our greatest blessings come when we are the most patient. My wife and I, um, before we had Judah, 
We had three. We had three. Four boys. We had three boys. Most of you guys know this. But we before we had Judah, I've always wanted four kids. Just why? If I'm being honest, I have no idea why that number. It's just always stuck in my head for most of my adult life. I'm the youngest of six. I thought one was too little. Two was like, eh. Three, I didn't want just a middle one. Four just always seemed good. Five seemed like a little, little too much for me. <laughs> and so, back in 2020, my wife and I had gotten pregnant, and she, she had a pretty bad miscarriage. And for like the last three, four years, I just put it off, if I'm being honest, like I'd put it off even right before we got pregnant with Judah, I'd put it off like, Lord, I guess it's just three. Waited three years. Now, three years compared to 30 or 40 in the desert like Moses is not long, but waited three years and I've written it off saying, God, I guess it's just not in the cards. We're going to have three and that's it and I'll be content. And then Judah came and it reminded me of God's timing, not mine. It reminded me of God's faithfulness even when I'm not faithful to him. It reminds us of life that is so much bigger than who we are. Romans 12, 12 tells us, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. That's what this church in Philadelphia was. They were joyful in their hope of who Christ was and what he was going to do. They were patient in their affliction because they were surrounded on all sides by evil. And they were faithful in their prayer to God and God only. As Augustine put it this way, patience is the companion to wisdom. And so have patience to be acknowledged by Jesus, not the world. In verse 11 it says this, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. This is not an earthly crown that he's talking about here, but it is the crown of life. Jesus is telling them to hold tightly to his word. Do not deny his name like others have. Hold tightly to the crown of life, not the crown of this world. Verse 12, it says, The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. You see, they were often in this area earthquakes in this area that happened in the city of Philadelphia. They happened, the earthquakes actually in this area happened so often that it would destroy the city constantly to where the only thing left standing were the pillars of the temple. You see, Jesus is looking at the believers of this church and is promising to set the believers in this temple in such a secure fashion that no earthquake, no for other forces could ever force them out. He tells the believers, when you stand faithful and strong to me, I will set you as pillars for the world to see. One thing that I see over and over is this world needs to see pillars of faith for Christ. Because there are too many people that are running away like little mice. That we need to be able to, be, to stand strong for our faith in what God has done. John 10, 27-30, God holds us in the hand that says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Whose word is it? It is Jesus. Whose promises? Whose promise is it? It is Christ's promise to you. So that's a great thing. We have a God that promises to be faithful to you. His word is true. He is holy. So that we know that we can trust his promises when he makes them. The final part for this morning is says, I will write them on them the name of my God. On, I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he ends each letter by saying that. Brings us to the third point is God writes his name on your heart. Now there's a couple ways he, says, he goes about this. God is our creator. He is our author. And he is the one who gives us our true eternal name. And it's his name we are saved by. It's his name we are righteous through. And it's his name that will all be written on our hearts for eternal salvation. You see, this passage here signifies identification and ownership of the church to God. We are his, and he is ours. We are in a relationship with God that can never be broken. We are his children. 
John 1, 12 tells us, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We talked about this before. We're all made in the image of God, but when you accept Christ, you become a child of God. It says it clearly right there. We know and we now bear the name of Jesus on our hearts for eternity. He doesn't bear our name. We bear his. And there's three, the wrap up this morning, there's three new names the scripture tells us that God's going to give his church. First one, he says, the name of God. We have God's name in our hearts. We are his possession. If you go back and read that passage, it says, I will write on them the name of my God. He's going to give you these three names to be secure in heaven someday. The first one is we get the name of God. We have God's name. It's a possession to him. The second one is the name of Jerusalem. We have citizenship in God's home. We are his possession, and we have citizenship in his home now. The third one is the name, the new name. Get this, the new name of Christ. We have a full revelation of Christ himself through a relationship with him. Scripture even tells us here. Think about what it says. Uh, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Jesus himself will be getting a new name. You see, a name symbolizes character, identity, and a role. No one knows the name of Jesus yet. Revelation 19.12 actually says this about Jesus who will appear with a new name. It says, His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a new, he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. You see, before Jesus set foot on earth as a baby, an angel announced to Joseph and Mary that she would bear his son and his name would be called Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus' name literally means Jehovah saves. When Jesus finishes his saving work and the end has come, the Bible tells us that he will take a new name. He will have a new role with a new name. Because in the end, when it is all done, the saving is done. We will live in glory for eternity with him. And it tells us he will write his new name on us as his possession. We will have a new home. We will be in possession with him, no one else. And we will live eternity with him in glory. This is what this church in Philadelphia, this is what I think the church even today, tomorrow, and forever longs patiently waits for Christ. In the, in the midst of everything that's going on in your life, the reward that we wait for is simple. The reward that we wait for is Jesus. I promise you someday in heaven when you stand before Jesus, you will look at him and you will think to yourself, you were worth waiting for. Because the rest of this world will fade away. All the gold, all the money, all the U.S. dollars, everything else will fade away. And you'll stand before Christ and see him in his glory in heaven and see it in that situation. And you will literally think to yourself, man, am I glad I waited. Wait patiently on the Lord. It is worth the endurance for your life, your spouse's life, your kid's life. So that others may know him and someday have that same song. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, Father. We thank you. We thank you for this time, this morning. God, to study your word, to know, Lord, that you hold the key. No one else. There's one key and you hold it. To have the patience to be acknowledged by you, even though the world tells us that we should be acknowledged by them. And Lord, to know that you will write your name on our heart that we are your possession, that we have a new home with you. God, I pray just as this church gets commended for their patience and waiting and, and loving you and your word, God, I pray that we would live that way too. This message shows us the blessings that come when we maintain our faith despite life's tribulations. I pray that we remember patience means trusting God. 
even when the circumstances haven't changed yet. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you. And God, I pray that we don't walk out of these doors basing our worship on us this morning and how we feel. But Lord, we walk out these doors today being reminded that we are the church. And Lord, we pray that you have been blessed, that you have been worshipped, not us. Lord, we love you and we thank you. As you just come forward this morning, I, I want to share with you that Kathy and I uh, are supporters of Moody Radio. Uh, we, we support two programs on there. Um, Janet Parshall is in the market, which is a fantastic show. And uh, Alistair Begg, uh, which you hear me talk about all the time, is the truth. Uh, the truth of life right now. So we get a, a, a newsletter, you know, periodically. And this had a story in here that just I've been wanting to share with you for weeks. I keep forgetting to put it in my bag, so I have it here today. Um, it says, Booty Radio's spring share campaign had begun. Having richly benefited from years of listening to Moody Radio programming, Jenna desperately wanted to con contribute a financial gift. There was a problem. After paying the water bill, I literally had only pennies left in my bank accounts, Jenna said. After wrestling with my son, myself, I decided to move my cents around from one account to the other to make one dollar. I donated that dollar. I told my daughter how sad it was I was so broke. I could only donate one dollar. She told me not to worry. Jesus will be happy. So Jenna included a note with her gift asking God to multiply this dollar. The Moody Radio host read her note on the air. It started a trend. The dollar turned into so much more than Jenna could have ever imagined. Jenna's story of sacrificial giving of a dollar in the wake of being unemployed and contending with the spiritual warfare in her home became the theme of share. Says Mark Durkin, producer of Curtin Cape Mornings, local listeners added a dollar to their gifts and national Moody Radio show host spoke of Jenna's Widow in the Mites gift. Today, Jenna is still amazed and grateful at how God took her small gift and multiplied it nationwide for the benefit of a radio ministry that is a staple in her home. What's the, uh, the story here? Uh, just to be faithful. Um, God says, or Jesus says, if you love me, follow my commands. And she was looking to follow that command in any way she could. And I try to end my, and I'll do it again today, in my prayers that God bless the gift and the giver. And you can see how God just did that. Bless the gift and the giver. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the worship time, Lord. I pray that it was pleasing to you. And we thank you, Lord, for your sermon. And uh, I ask that we could give a spirit of perseverance as we go through our lives as Christians and, and we are attacked from one angle and attacked from another angle, whether it's inside the home or outside the home and business, even in church, Lord. Um, I just pray that we would uh, keep our eyes faithfully on you and, and, and have that perseverance to know that, Lord, we have read in the book, you do win. Lord, we, uh, I ask you to bless these gifts and bless the giver. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
know, my parents are the heroes to my faith. And for us to think about who is the hero to your faith, whether it's your mom and dad, grandma or grandpa, aunt or uncle, maybe it was a complete stranger or someone in your church growing up. Like the heroes to our faith and how significant that is to pass down our faith to the next generation, not just our kids, but our neighbors and whoever that you can bring to the Lord to bring the hero in their faith of saying Jesus Christ is in your way. That is what will stand for eternity. The people in the Bible did great many things. God took people who were nobodies and took them to do something. And no matter where you stand today, whether you think you are a nobody, insignificant, God has a perfect plan for your life. And that is to love Him, to be sold out for Him, even when everything else fails. Because when you are sold out for Christ, you can be a hero in someone's life and tell them who Jesus Christ is. That they can stand in heaven before Christ and say, I know Jesus because this person shared his name with me. That's what a hero of the faith means. To live your faith out here now before someone else that they can know Jesus. That's what we're commanded to. So let us pray. Lord, we love you, Father. We thank you, God. We pray that this praise and offering was to you and to you only. Lord, we give you the glory. No matter how we feel, Lord, it is about you receiving the glory. That, God, we walk faithfully with you. That you have given us a hope in this life. That it's something bigger, more grander beyond this life. God, it is with you in heaven, with Jesus on the throne for eternity. That someday, that when we stand before you, we are going to see what our patience and faithfulness meant. Because you are so much more worthy than anything here on earth. May we be that patient church, Lord. God, while we wait, may we faithfully share your name with everybody that we come across. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this morning to, to be able to worship you and you alone, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Have a great rest of your day. If you haven't signed up for the Metropolitan Ministry Tent, please do so. You can talk to Kevin here. It's a wonderful thing that we do over Thanksgiving and Christmas to be able to serve and share. God bless.